We are live in the Giving Garden. Hi, Melissa, and the and the rest of the Girl Food Northampton community. Hi. Hello, hello. It's a beautiful day in the Giving Garden and at the community garden. And there's been people here. There's been people here all morning. I think picking up their plant starts from Susan at Sawmill Herb Farm and starting to put things in the ground. I even think that some people have put in their tomatoes in the ground already, which is a little bold, but. Maybe actually tonight it's going to get cold. I, I don't remember the forecast. But uh, my tomatoes are going to, and the giving garden are going to go in the ground next week. Um, so that's, so it is almost tomato time. And we just put all the cucumbers in too. Yes, they look great. Yeah, we, we can't see them from here, but actually they're under that, that white, that white cloth. Yeah. Um, so we've got, we've got our cucumbers and our summer squash. And they're all planted. And why did you decide to use the row cover with the cucumbers? Oh, good idea. Well, the row cover is really helpful because of pests like the cucumber beetle, mm. and um, then, the, then the cucumber beetle carries disease on it. And as it goes from flower to flower to flower, it spreads. And then, um, yeah, the cucumbers don't look so good, and the plants don't do as well and suffer. Um, but not our cucumbers. Yeah, I hope to protect our cucumbers. Uh, well so, protected. So let me introduce myself and you uh, as our as um, our weekly Facebook Live. Moss is here. <laughs> Hello. So we are here at the Giving Garden where we grow thousands of pounds of food. Last year it was uh, roughly 8,000 pounds for uh, five different community partners in the area wow. where we donate food. And um, we donate this food to people who can't afford it themselves or are not able to go to the store for any number of reasons, and uh, including the soup kitchen and the Northampton Survival Center. And we get all this amazing funding from Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. And here we are at Grove Northampton. I'm Elena, and Melissa's with me. Hi. As the camera person and uh, uh, today I want to show you a few really special things uh, because well it's spring and we really can feel it here uh, I even went swimming in the river the other day and uh, so it's warm enough to do that and we uh, can we can we come over here yeah well yeah. last week if you remember oh, if you yes. were tuned in it was super windy, which we often, we're in a little bit of a wind tunnel here. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's a great thing to remember. So it was so windy here last week and on the camera. And uh, especially in the spring, before the trees get their leaves behind us, there we, we, um, we experienced so much wind coming right through here. And so that made us think about what plants need the wind. So there's so many plants that need the wind and we just wanted to, you know, take a moment to appreciate them because, because uh, we couldn't do it without these plants too. Lots of plants need insects and bees and different flying critters to pollinate them, but some plants need the wind. So here we are, I'm standing in front of a plant. Uh, Want to guess what it is? <laughs> Any of our viewers know what? What this we're looking at is. today it's a kind of grass so if anybody thinks it's a grass you're right and it's a special grass it's winter rye and if we get a little closer view this grass has started to form there's flower heads and these are going to open up and have these really really beautiful little tiny yellow flowers are going to emerge and they're all going to be pollinated by the wind and send them out and we grow this grass why do we grow this grass because it's a because it's a cover crop and it helps hold the soil and it helps nourish the soil when we're not growing food. So I'm taking these whole 10 beds right here and I'm nourishing the soil in these 10 beds for this whole season to let them replenish and rejuvenate after they grew so many tomatoes for us last year. So planted winter rye in the fall. It's this beautiful blue color and it needs the wind to pollinate it. Um, what else about winter rye is so cool? Um, it has really deep roots. Yeah, it has really deep roots. Um, and um, and it, it has really deep roots and it, um, 
And also, you can even see here, special little red flower of the first of our crimson clover popping up. So I planted crimson clover within the winter rye and not just for aesthetic purposes, even though I think it is so beautiful, uh, because the crimson clover can be the nitrogen source for this bed as it is replenishing after we grow our crops. We have a question about how will the winter rye rejuvenate the soil? Mm, well, so it's long tap roots are going into the soil and holding it there and making it sure that, that, um, that there's no erosion or the nutrients don't spill off. And then also we're going to, maybe we're gonna be able to even do this on Facebook Live in a few weeks, probably in like a month or so, we're gonna take a metal stake and we're gonna tie it to our shoes kind of funny what? and we're going one person on either side of this path and we're gonna we're gonna fold all of the rye down after it flowers we're gonna crimp all of it so it's gonna lie down on the bed we're gonna crimp all of it with this metal stake and then we're gonna put a tarp over it and then that tarp will mean that it will decompose under there and all of this beautiful green organic material is all gonna decompose underneath the tarp and it's going to um, be food for all of the beneficial bacteria and microorganisms in the soil. So it's kind of part of this long process of helping to nutrify the soil. And that's why, that's why, we, that's why we choose this plant for only for this section because it also demonstrates this technique. Um, yeah, and so, okay, wind pollinated. Grasses are wind pollinated. There are so many things that are wind pollinated that we wouldn't necessarily expect, like this. <laughs> this is this is one of my favorite wind pollinated plants. I think when I'm wearing a mask right now, I'm not going to be able to blow it. Uh, I think I think that's true. Uh, but you can imagine, and I can wave it in the air. And. Uh, we do get a ton of wind here, so I'm sure that that is one of the reasons why the dandelions really, really yes, love to grow in this spot. We have a whole... Dandelions are very prolific here. We've got a whole little... Yeah, we've got a little, little dandelion forest in this path. And this is, the, this is the farm road that is right next to the Giving Garden, and it leads over there to um, Sawmill Herb Farm and Song Sparrow Farm over there. And um, so I wanted to talk about another wind pollinated plant, which is super cool. It's one of my favorites and it's right here. So this is our hedgerow. And this hedgerow is actually supposed to block the wind and it helps serve as this protection barrier. Well, I can't imagine what it would be like without it. Because That's <laughs> very true. Um, so this plant, anyone want to guess what this plant is? I don't know if you know in the comments. Uh, it's, let me give you a full picture. There's, there's many of them. It's a small tree or like big shrub. It has many different stems on it. It's, it's actually, so no, this plant grows, this plant grows something that you're all familiar with. And we'll, uh, we'll check it out. And this can be shrub-like or you can prune it to be more tree-like. Yeah. It's, um... Well, it's a smaller tree, then it does produce something that we can eat. Yeah, it produces something that's very tasty and usually people blend it with something else. Usually people blend it with chocolate and then they really like it. So this, it is a, a nut. <laughs> it's a nut, it's a nut. It's a hazelnut. So this is an American hazelnut. And I have some show and tell of the hazelnuts that I collected last year. I can take one. So they look like these amazing, crazy fruits that have, these are all the empty casings. And you know, last year when I had several different field trip groups of, of um, I think they were fifth graders and sixth graders and the, uh, the hazelnuts were ready and we, we cracked them all and we used rocks and we cracked them and the, um, the students snacked on them and it was so awesome. 
Oh, that was in that was in September. Yeah, I was year. here for that. Yeah. So. And they loved them. Um, yeah. It was such a treat. So these are what the hazelnuts look like, and I wanted to show you because we kind of passed it, but it is a wind pollinated plant and it has this really cool flower. I mean, yeah, it is a flower. I mean, it's hardly a flower. It's called a catkin. So this catkin, I'm gonna break it off because it's pretty much gone. And you know why it's called a catkin? Very funny. Uh, I just learned this today. <laughs> comes from, uh, the word comes from Middle Dutch and it's the word for kitten. And so, it, cause it kind of reminds you of a kitten's tail or maybe the fur of a kitten. Maybe is not. it fuzzy? Yeah, it is. This one I think is, has lost its fuzz prime, but, uh, but this is, this is a catkin and they're very special flowers. So they have all these very, very, very tiny flowers in here that open up and then who moves around a very tiny flower? The wind. So then the wind spreads the pollen from the very tiny flower and um, brings it to these little flowers. And then it pollinates the plant. So it's kind of like a two part, two part uh, flowering plant. It's got uh, male flowers and female flowers and they go in different places. And it's really even better if you have two different kinds of hazelnuts and then you can, um, yeah, and then you can uh, have more strength in your in your genetic pool. So, anyway, those are hazelnuts, and uh, yeah, anyone ever who I don't know people. So I harvested these hazelnuts, and I've roasted them before. Yeah. And people can comment on if they, I don't know if they like hazelnuts, what kind of things they make with them. Um, these are very small. These are very small, so actually once you crack them open, the meat inside is quite small. But that's because this is an American hazelnut and it's the native uh, variety that doesn't, it's not bred to produce huge fruit. It's bred to just, it's a, it's the way it was in the wild first. Uh, so, and it is easy to harvest. Yeah, if very you can easy. Wait, if, you, if you can wait, they will drop themselves to the ground. Yeah. They will. When they're ripe, but you do have to consider the squirrels really want them also. Yeah. So it's kind of a race against time. <laughs> yes. So you gotta beat the squirrels to the hazelnuts. But if you can, these are. It's an amazing, amazing to have this protein source here that we grow. Um, and I love when people come on field trips and I can show them the hazelnuts. Uh, and so, okay, so I have one lost show and tell, and that's an animal that eats the leaves off of this hazelnut and off of many other trees. Uh, <laughs> and it's not, and it's an animal that changes shape and it changes form over time. It goes through a process of metamorphosis. Anybody know? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> um, okay. I gotta get a close up of this because this is really neat. So, this. It's got like these copper airs on it. Yeah. They are really amazing. So, um, okay, so I'm gonna say what this is. I mean, it's a cocoon, which maybe you have guessed. It's a cocoon of a very special moth, and it's a moth called a Cecropia moth. And uh, at my house, we have five of them, and uh, maybe four of them. And um, they're in a they're in a container that's big enough so that if they when they open, they can have enough room. What kind of container? To spread their wings. It's sort of like a cage, and it has a pillowcase in the back of it, so it's very easy once they hatch that we can take off the pillowcase, and then we can let them um, let them go into the world. And Okay, Cecropia moth, super cool. It When it's a caterpillar, it's huge and green and has different colored dots on it. Mm. And Cecropia, mm. it's named after King Cecrops of some country that I'm forgetting, but it's very kingly and it's very huge or queenly. It's just very majestic. Regal. And it's regal and it's so big. 
It's more than six inches or more wingspan. Wow. It's the largest moth native to North America. And uh, what does it look like when it becomes a moth? Um, okay, so it's different shades of brown and gray. It sort of looks like the gold of this of this cocoon in the in the light. You know, it's a little bit like a drab looking cocoon in the dark, but then and it camouflages really well. But then in the sunlight, it um, looks kind of golden, and um, and then it has red circles on it, like eyes on the wings. Oh wow! Like red eyes, um, different says- colors that he loves the Cecropia moss and that he's had a few wild ones in his hands. Wow, cool. Yes, I have not held them, but so I watched, so so when they come out of their cocoon, they um, have these huge antenna and they have these huge fuzzy antenna that can pick up um, smells or pheromones from up to a mile away wow. to look for um, to look for other Cecropia moths. Oh, and so, moths don't usually have long antenna. Yeah. Well, these ones, well, they're very big wings. So, yeah. So their antenna are very big. Uh, and, and the reason why they're so big is so that they can sense the pheromones from up to a mile away. Um, so it's very cool that we get to have this Cecropia moth here. And just to understand the life cycle of how, when it was a caterpillar, it ate um, hazelnut leaves mm-hmm. and it can eat so many of these leaves if you imagine how big this cocoon is and how big the caterpillar is it can go through I mean I don't even know but many different leaves uh, just in a few minutes um, and uh, yeah so we just wanted to yeah to, to like remember what we just did we talked about the wind and how much we need the wind even though at this moment specifically there's a lot of wind and sometimes it's hard to hear and sometimes it's hard to go about our day but really the wind helps so many plants uh, complete their life cycle and pollinate and the grasses and our and our cover crop and uh, then they can get pollinated and uh, and uh, yeah and so and, it, and it's a really special time of year right now when everything is starting to bloom and this cecropia moth will probably it opens in like late May, early June. So maybe even by next week, it will have opened. Uh, So I didn't want to wait much longer before showing it to you. Um, Okay, so that's all for now. And um, yeah, see you next time. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.